podcast listeners. I'm your host, Jack Oswetsit. Welcome to the NK News podcast today. It is Monday, December the 5th, 2022, and I'm joined here in the studio by three members of the NK News and NK Pro team to discuss some of the recent news stories out of and about North Korea. But please, before we begin, just a reminder to leave a review about this podcast on iTunes or whatever platform you use and share this episode with colleagues, friends, and even enemies, and especially frenemies. And what's more, like and subscribe. Secondly, check out nknews.org where you can find all the in-depth stories written by the excellent journalists that I'll be talking to today. You should consider buying a subscription for a year. It's more affordable than you think. In fact, if you think if you sign up for the annual plan, It's even less than a dollar a day, and that helps to fund the excellent work that my colleagues put out every day. That's the second time I've used the word excellent here. I guess it's sincere. Third, follow us on Twitter. You can find each of our handles in the show notes, and NK News Org is a general one for the whole platform. Now, to introduce our three guests today, we have my colleagues and roundtable veterans, James Fretwell and Ifang Bremer, and for her NK News podcast, our hardworking intern, Yeji Chong. Welcome on the show, all of you. Thank you. Good morning. Yeji, let's begin with you. A little bit of a self-intro, I think, is in order here. How did you come to be interested in North Korea and do an internship here at NK News? Um, So, hi, everyone. Um, I'm an intern here at NK News as well as a student in college um, studying political science and journalism. Well, I've known about NK News for a long time since I've been working as a student reporter throughout my college career. And my interest focused on inter-Korean relations slash history I also interned at North Korea-related NGO previously, so I frequently read and cited um, NK News Pro pieces. Um, Then fortunately, I was able to uh, grasp this opportunity, and now I'm here. That's excellent. And what kind of projects have you been working on? Um, The latest ones I've been working on are, um, although we'll talk uh, further about them later, the BTS uh, member Jean's frontline conscription article and a defector turned into a YouTuber article. Mm-hmm. Um, as for solo pieces, I published one about South Korea stalking crimes on Korea Pro and a short spot news about the custody row of the dog that was gifted by Kim Jong-un to the former President Moon Jae-in. Who's got that, that dog now? Or um, those dogs? Wait, are there two? There were two, weren't there? There were two, there yes. Were two. Who's got those dogs now? I believe they're in the custody of the current presidential office. Now. Ah, okay. Uh, and right now, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, now I'm writing a piece that addresses the recent removal of the word um, sexual minority in South Korean textbooks, um, which some experts have uh, expressed deep concerns about. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, so you're doing not just uh, North Korea related stories, but also South Korea for Korea Pro. Yes. All right. And what would you lo- most like to achieve or accomplish before you leave your internship here? Um, I'm already learning so much every day by working here and by the term ends, I like to advance my own journalistic skills as much as possible, um, build up that field experience and be able to utilize it in the future as I'm aspiring to be a journalist one day. Uh, but most importantly, I like to make good memories with my awesome teammates as much as possible and just be helpful to them. Hopefully this will become one of them. Uh, well done and, uh, and good luck with that. All right, James. Uh, we are here with you every month uh, for the month in review, and it, that, for our listeners don't know, is a uh, is a product. It's a kind of a digest that you put together at the end of each month and send to our NK Pro subscribers. Uh, tell us what kind of things go into a month in review and why we make it. Um, everything goes into the month in review, really. Every, everything and and ev- and anything to do with North Korea. Um, we cover topics ranging from the military to the missiles to the human rights to foreign relations. Um, and in every section, we pick the three most important developments uh, that month. And that will be a summary of those events and then also an analysis to explain uh, why it matters, to put it in context. My fabulous reporter colleagues will, of course, uh, you know, every day working very hard to bring you the news as it comes. But I have the luxury, I suppose, of being able to uh, take a step back and write about it more in a, in a wider context and group everything together. I'm mostly, uh, I'm writing most of it, but uh, we have the superb Peter Ward and Martin Weiser as well to ah. write about North Korea's economy and leadership. Okay. And as you said, it, it's more from a, it, it's a longer and broader view than the minutiae that you would find in, in a day-to-day article, right? It is very long, yep. Yeah. Um, so you, it's very in-depth and you can, uh, you know, read the whole thing or you can just dip into whatever uh, uh, whatever particular part about North Korea that you're interested in. And give us a, a brief rundown of what's in the November month in review. This one was a uh, really mammoth 
month in review. It was a big month. A lot happened. So I can't go into absolutely everything. You'd have to check it out on the uh, NK Pro website. Mm. Click the month in review section on the homepage. Right. And NK Pro subscribers also get it sent to them as a uh, as a PDF uh, file. So you can right. read it on the website or as a PDF. Indeed. Um, I'd say my top five, uh, the top five most important developments, I'm going to say uh, North Korea's Hwasong-17 ICBM launch and all the other missiles that it launched in November, which we'll talk about later mm-hmm. in the podcast. Uh, also, we'll talk about later in the podcast, Kim Jong-un's daughter and uh, what revealing uh, his daughter to the world means. Uh, Joe Biden and Xi Jinping's first in-person summit and what they discussed on North Korea. Accusations uh, about North Korea supplying Russia with weapons and South Korea supplying uh, Ukraine with, with weapons. And also signs of a limited vaccine campaign mm. in North Korea. Okay, all very important stories indeed. Uh, Yifeng, let's start with you. Uh, what is the, in your opinion, the most important story that you have followed in the last month? Um, yeah, that must be the recent developments in the um, case that's been dubbed the West Sea case. So um, back in 2020, September uh, 2020, a 47-year-old fisheries official, South Korean fisheries official, Lee dae Jun disappeared from a South Korean patrol boat some six miles uh, f- south of the northern limit line in the Yellow Sea. And a few day- days later, uh, Seoul and uh, both Seoul and Pyongyang confirmed he had been shot and killed in North Korean waters uh, the night after he disappeared. Um, and and this, just to go back to the very beginning, there's some confusion and dispute about whether he fell off the boat or jump off the jumped off the boat exactly and, and yeah. if so what was he trying to do exactly so that that's that's what i uh, was getting at so basically yeah it's it's become a big dispute whether or not previous president moon jae-in deliberately tried to push a false narrative uh, wanting to frame this fisheries official uh, as a defector uh, to avoid um derailing engagement with the dprk at the time mm. yeah Yes, and we, we've already seen uh, in previous months prosecutors try to uh, arrest President Moon Jae-in's former defense minister, Sa Uk, and the former Coast Guard commander, uh, commissioner, Kim Hong-hee, for their involvement in this, uh, this West Sea case. Uh, and now they've requested an arrest warrant for former national security advisor, Sa Hun. So what is it that, uh, what's the part that these former Moon administration officials are supposed to have played in the story? Right, so the prosecution is investigating allegations of abuse of power and forging official documents. Mm. So essentially, they're looking into whether the Moon uh, administration deliberately tried to push this false narrative. Um, that is what uh, the brother of the uh, Fisher's official... And th- that false narrative being that he willingly tried to defect to North Korea, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. Um, and we don't know whether this is the case or not, whether he actually chose to defect or whether he just, yeah, floated right. into North Korean waters and but was killed But the South Korean government's position basically was, yeah, case closed, he was a defector. Yeah, at the time, Moon Jae-in administration was really quick to say, hey, um, this guy wanted to go to North Korea, mm. but, uh, yeah, the family members of the, the slain uh, fisheries official really doubt that narrative and actually say that there's no evidence for that, yeah. Uh, Have any of the officials thus far been formally charged? No, no one has been charged as of now. But last week, prosecutors announced that they wanted to to arrest uh, Sohun, the Mm. previous national security official uh, for for Moon Jae-in. So that's really a high-level government official. Um, So that was really uh, a big step in this case. And he has actually been arrested now. Oh, yeah. Okay, so he's been arrested, but that doesn't mean that he'll necessarily be charged, right? It exactly, It just means that yeah. they're, they're going to question him, and if they are convinced they have enough evidence, they might charge him. Yes, that's right. Right. What's the position of the man's family? I know that his brother has been on, on the record uh, with the media a number of times. Yeah, so Lee's brother, Ire Jin, is very, very vocal on the matter. Uh, he is actually the one who uh, first filed a criminal complaint mm. against his really high-level former uh, officials, the defense minister, and also national security advisor, uh, accusing them of um, you know, deleting public records uh, related to the incident. Yep. And after that, prosecutors raided the homes and offices of these officials. Uh, so yeah, he's really the one, uh, his brother is really the one pushing this case. Yeah. 
Uh, now, former President Moon has recently made his first public statement about the case. Uh, what's he saying? So yeah, Moon released a statement last week basically claiming that he worked with the information that was given to him at the time by mm -hmm. his officials and that nothing has changed, the information is the same, but as soon as the administration changed, the conclusions suddenly changed from the ministries. Mm. Uh, so Moon's argument is that the investigations currently happening by the prosecutor's office are politically motivated. Mm. Yeah. So he's saying basically it's all politics. Exactly. But the interesting thing is that he has not explicitly defended his yeah. ex-officials uh, saying, hey, this is not true because blah, mm. blah, blah, blah. No, he just said like this. these investigations in general are politically motivated. Yeah. Um, so, for example, this morning uh, he, re he tweeted about uh, Sohun uh, and said, well, this guy, the former national security advisor that has been arrested now, is a great North Korean specialist. And uh, it's really a loss for inter-Korean relations mm. that he that he's under investigation right now. But he has not said um, he shouldn't be <laughs> under investigation because right. the allegations are not true. So I think that's quite interesting. And and sort of taking the long view here, it's not yeah. the first time that uh, the possibility of hurting inter-Korean relations is cited as a reason for not looking into something or not doing not, not taking a particular course of action. You know, it's uh, right. Uh, over the last uh, 20, 30 years, certainly since the Sunshine Policy period, it, we've heard a, a number of times where people would say, well, don't do that because it, it might make North Korea angry or don't do that or it might hurt uh, inter-Korean relations. As you say, it doesn't mean that there's no truth to the matter. Now, exactly. meanwhile, the, the South Korea's Board of Audit and Inspection did its own investigation uh, back in October, and it concluded that the Moon administration had manipulated and even concealed evidence uh, during the inv their investigation into the shooting death of that uh, uh, government official, Ide Jun, at the hands of North Korean soldiers. Now, as a journalist and also as a non-voter in Korean elections, you try to be objective on these issues and, and not get involved in the politics of it all. And so I want to know what your assessment of the situation is. Do you think Ide Jun was trying to defect? And do you think that the Moon administration manipulated and concealed evidence? That's a very difficult question. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that there are no political motivation involved. I mean, we know that under current President Yoon, uh, who is a former prosecutor himself, mm -hmm. the prosecutor's office has been fiercely investigating Moon Jae-in officials mm. for basically a whole range of possible violations. So, But at the same time, you know, Moon Jae-in's officials' handling of the this case of the death of Lee Dae-jun really deserves to be scrutinized, I think, because... You know, very shortly after uh, he was killed, officials under Moon already raised the defection scenario, mm -hmm. and they were really quick to disclose personal information that is not evidence, mm. frankly, such as uh, the fish fisheries officials alleged gambling debt, right? That kind of stuff. That's that's not evidence. That's no. just circumstantial and speculation. So. Yeah, it's really hard to say right now what actually happened. I would need to see more concrete evidence. But I think in general, it makes sense that this case is being investigated at the moment. But then again, probably political motivations are also involved. But as you kind of hinted at, the uh, the original investigation by the Moon administration itself had some political elements to it, right? So exactly. both this investigation and the original investigation have some politics involved, but there's still something there to look at and, and find out what really happened. Yeah, and that's the true tragedy of this case, mm. that you know, it's so ex it became so extremely political yep. that um, it's going to be really difficult to say at the end, well, hey, um, yeah, this is what happened. Right, and of course that, that matters a lot to, to uh, the man's family uh, as well. To, yes, to find exactly. Out the truth. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, Yifang. Uh, James, let's talk to you about the uh, the month in review. Let's drill down a little bit into the weapons of mass destruction and military sections. Uh, last month in November, as we all remember, November was an un or had an unprecedented number of North Korean missile launches, uh, including but not limited to the uh, the Hwasong-17 ICBM that you just mentioned in the introduction. Meanwhile, a South Korean MSAM interceptor exploded during an Air Force competition. Uh, which was not good. And the defense chiefs of South Korea and the U.S. talked about the deployment of strategic assets on the Korean Peninsula. So kind of wrap it all up for us. Tell us what it all means and why it's significant. Goodness me, yes, there was a lot going on. I guess, um, you know, you could divide it into uh, the huge number of missiles that North Korea um, launched during military drills. 
Um, that included an uh, unprecedented 23 in just one day. Yep. So that's more missiles in a day than sometimes they've launched in, a, in an entire year. So there are those missiles. And then there's the big one that really got the international headlines, which was uh, North Korea's launch of the Hwasong-17 mm. intercontinental ballistic missile. So that means it can reach all the way to the continental United States. It's the world's largest road mobile liquid fueled missile. Ah. Um, now this is uh, this missile is important because even though, uh, as I'm sure you'll all remember, uh, North Korea could all already hit the US mainland uh, with the Hwasong-15 that it first tested in 2017. So, you know, why does it matter that it's, it's still able to, well, there must be a reason that the Hwasong-17 is so huge, right? And uh, the real significance of this missile probably is that uh, North Korea uh, might be intending to equip it with multiple mm. nuclear warheads. So okay, that means so a multiple bigger warheads. Payload. Right, right, exactly, yeah. It was also notable, I'll just add as well, because North Korea, uh, state media, they described uh, the missile launch as marking uh, the Hwasong 17's completion of the development. Uh, which is significant because in March it also claimed to uh, launch the Hwasong-17 for the first time. But uh, analysis of satellite imagery and TV footage by another, none other than our, our own Colin Zwerko mm. suggested that this launch actually failed and that North Korea covered it up by uh, launching uh, another Hwasong-17 for propaganda purposes. Okay, so the May launch may have been a failure, but the November launch certainly wasn't. March launch, yeah. March launch, mm -hmm. pardon, yeah. Uh, now, what are these strategic assets that are being discussed that the U.S. might deploy uh, in Korea? And, and what, what is there that is not already here in Korea? What's, what could possibly deploy that's new? There's quite a lot here that, uh, that, that's not uh, here in Korea. There's quite a lot that is here in Korea, uh, most significantly the presence uh, of U.S. military personnel. Um, strategic assets, though, that refers to usually uh, aircraft carriers, nuclear-powered submarines, nuclear-capable bombers. Uh, the context is that South Korea has been pushing for security assurances from the U.S. because North Korea is rapidly accelerating its, its nuclear weapons program. And, of course, South Korea doesn't have uh, nuclear weapons of its own, so it relies on the U.S. to provide uh, extended deterrence. Mm. Uh, it relies on that alliance, and if that alliance is strong, then South Korea is assured it, we don't need to develop our own nuclear weapons. Uh, but a lot of people might be feeling a little bit uneasy. You know, North Korea's weapons are so advanced now. Would the U.S. really come to uh, our assistance if there if there was a war? Yeah, uh, I'm curious. Is mm -hmm. either side, either uh, South Korea? or the United States, uh, officially, you know, people from the defense ministries, are either of them talking about uh, the possible deployment of UN um, strategic, or sorry, tactical nuclear weapons back on the Korean Peninsula, just as an aside that we haven't had any here since 1992 when they were all removed under uh, President George H.W. Bush? I think the thing that is being discussed is um, getting strategic assets deployed uh, to the peninsula. So there was a meeting between the defense chiefs uh, Austin and Lee um, in November, and um, there were the South Korea and the U.S. kind of uh, reported on this meeting slightly differently. There was a little bit of nuance there. Mm. So Lee said that Austin uh, pledged to respond to North Korea's provocations by deploying uh, strategic assets uh, to the level equivalent to constant deployment. Um, which is a little bit of, you know, kind of strange phrasing. Mm -hmm. um, and Austin said that uh, the U.S. doesn't have a plan to uh, change the, the permanent positioning or stationing of the assets, um, but that, uh, you know, the, these assets will move in and out on a routine basis. Um, so one of these uh, assets, uh, strategic assets, the uh, USS Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. aircraft carrier, that's the one that you might have seen in the news. It's been coming out uh, in and out of the peninsula uh, to conduct drills with South Korea and Japan. So it came to waters uh, near the peninsula for the first time in five years mm. in September. So that was a really big deal. And uh, then it came back in October. It left, it went off on its way, and then North Korea launched uh, a missile over Japan, and it came back. So mm. I think that really shows um, that the U.S. is... Um, 
you know, trying to reassure its South Korean a- ally um, by, you know, when something happens on the peninsula that, uh, you know, it will get the, the attention from these big US assets that, it, that it's asking for. Now, it does seem that we've seen this movie before. Uh, it feels very reminiscent of 2017. We have uh, this cycle of, uh, of what, what some call provocations and escalation and harsh words and missiles. Does it look like either North Korea or South Korea is willing to back down at this point? So we've had a, a lot of military exercises, um, you know, over the last few months, and all of them, uh, or a lot of them have been explicitly framed as a, a response to the other one. Now, since the ICBM launch um, on November the 18th, I guess things have quietened down a little bit. And, you know, state media said that, uh, you know, this this weapons development is complete. So, you know, maybe North Korea's, you know, done what it's, what it's doing. But you never know, of course. Um, and that's probably not the case. Mm. Uh, we could have uh, more missile launches. Um, remember the, the US, South Korea and Japan uh, are talking about sanctions all the time. Uh, there could be a response to that. There could even be a nuclear test on the horizon. Yes. I know we've been predicting this for a, for a very long time, but it really could be mm-hmm. uh, just around the corner. And if that happens, obviously, uh, there's going to be military drills from the, from the US and its allies. Uh, the big risk is that, um, you know, there's, there's an accident during one of these drills. You know, maybe, uh, maybe a, a plane goes too close to the border or there's a artillery shell that lands in the wrong place or even a missile malfunctions right and uh, someone gets the wrong message on on either side and and responds too strongly and that's when you could get a an escalation that involves um, casualties potentially indeed that is a a concerning situation thank you very much james uh ifang you and uh, yeji have been working t- uh, closely together on some stories lately and tell us about the uh, the most recent one about a a North Korean soldier who's become a YouTube star. Um, yeah, so this is a story about Chang Hane, who is a YouTuber now. Um, he was only 16 when he was sent to serve for the People's Army, I believe sometime between 2011 and 2012. Mm-hmm. Wow, 16, that's very long. Uh, what, what do we know about the, uh, the mandatory military conscription in North Korea? Uh, who has to go and, and how long? Is it, and are they normally conscripted at the age of 16 or is this a bit of an outlier? Um, so every able-bodied male um, in North Korea are required to serve in the military, um, just like South Korea's compulsory mi- military system. Uh, however, one difference is that North Koreans are required to serve for 10 years, unlike 18 months in South Korea mm. to be discharged. Um, for special forces, it's even longer. They have to serve 13 years. Um, Hane Jong also told me that um, children of more privileged backgrounds, for example, um, sons of high-ranking party members are usually stationed in central Pyongyang, where they're well-fed and kept warm, while those without rich or powerful parents are sent to further outskirts of the country where there's um, severe food shortages and harsh winters. Right. Now, is 16 an, an unusual age for uh, being brought into the military? Um, I don't think so. Okay. When I went there uh, for the first time to North Korea in 2010, my uh, male guide, there were two, one woman, one man, the man, he was, I think, around 24 at the time, he explicitly said to me, and I asked him on multiple occasions, that uh, military uh, service in North Korea was entirely voluntary. I don't know what to make of that, uh, but he clearly hadn't been to the army. Yeah, it's not voluntary. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) Uh, So where was uh, Jong Han stationed as a soldier? Uh, so he was stationed in the front line near the inter-Korean delimit- demilitarized zone and on the west side of the border. On the west side. Okay, so that is uh, somewhere not far from uh, the five islands of, uh, of the West Sea and perhaps in, the, in Hwangae province. Uh, now, what, uh, what, do, what do we know about the way that North Korean soldiers, what the conditions that North Korean soldiers live in? Are they usually fed and clothed well? So there are much variation between uh, the units. Uh, Like I said earlier, some will be very well fed and kept warm. Um, But speaking generally, that is not the case for most soldiers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chong's told me that his unit only served him white rice and some oil that he weighed about 94 pounds at the time. Um, but it was more... Wait, uh, hold on, Ifang, what's that in kilograms? That is 43 kilograms. Okay, so that's that's quite a low body weight. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it was more heartbreaking to hear that the borderline unit was just comparatively well supplied than others in the back line. Mm. Um, so he also graphically explained to me how malnourished um, 
uh, many of the soldiers were that some would not even have the strength to keep their necks straight up, and some even collapsing to death. Sure. Now that's it's surprising to hear that the the frontline troops are. Uh uh, this poorly, or were back in, in 2011, 2012, were this poorly uh, fed, you would expect that the frontline troops would get you know, quite a, a good ration to prevent them from wanting to defect? Yeah, so apparent, and then just imagine that they probably had it better than right. uh, troops further inland. Yeah. Um, have you met him? Do you know how tall he is? Uh, yeah, he's only about my height, which is 164 centimeters. Okay, so that because we, you know, that's one of the things that's been happening for a long time. Uh, we've been hearing from various international aid organizations that there's a significant stunting of the North Korean male population, at least non elite male population, that they tend not to grow up to uh, as tall as their South Korean uh, counterparts. Uh, now, what did, um, what do North Korean soldiers do when they don't have enough food, when they're just getting a little bit of rice and some oil? Um, yeah, so he told me that there were systematic corruption um, in, within the military, uh, where higher ops would force the lower, lower rankings to raid civilian villages and steal food from them. Mm. In fact, Chung's squad leader had pressured him to plunder a nearby village and steal food, and interestingly not to put food on the table for the starving soldiers, but all for himself. Oh, for the, for the squad leader? Mm-hmm. Okay, and what did Jong decide to do when uh, given such orders? Uh, he said he's never stolen anything from anyone um, in his life that he was terrified of the order. Um, he felt enraged about how corrupt and unfair the system was. So then he decided, decided to escape the regime. And it was quite the spectacular uh, escape. He uh, fled, the bo- uh, fled uh, his unit um, armed with an AK-47 and two grenades. It's really a truly uh, yeah, a special story. Wow. Um, yeah, and eventually made it to the South Korean border. Uh, where he was met by South, South Korean soldiers and, uh, yeah, was successfully defected. I'm curious, what did he intend to do with the AK-47 and two grenades? Who was he intending to use them on? Uh, so basically what, what he told us is that um, he was on patrol, or at least, uh, yeah, during that the time he defected. So he was armed, and in case he would be shot, because mm-hmm. North Korean soldiers are instructed to shoot any uh, other North Korean soldier wanting to defect, mm. he would fight back. Yeah, right. We saw that back in uh, 20, late 2017 when the uh, Sergeant O uh, ran across it at uh, Panmunjom and was shot a number of times by his former colleagues. Yeah, right. That really, you know, um, that vo- the video that went viral mm. of him literally crossing the border with a with a with a jeep. Yeah, it, yeah. it does happen from time to time. Right. Yeah. yeah, it is quite rare to to uh, escape across the demilitarized zone. Uh, why is that? But because it's simply extremely difficult. You have to imagine the, the border between North and South Korea is filled with minefields. Mm-hmm. Um, you have North Korean guards patrolling with shoot-to-kill orders, um, high fences. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's really challenging. And sometimes it happens. Like every two years, maybe a handful of soldiers make it. Yeah. And I understand that some of those fences are electrified. Yeah, that's right. So it, what Jung uh, told us is that uh, there was a big storm mm-hmm. uh, before he defected that kind of um, yeah, destroyed some of the electric fencing. Uh, so he saw that opportunity as his time to, uh, to defect. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, now he, uh, he is a, he, a YouTuber. Mm. Uh, so he started a YouTube channel uh, together with one of his defective friends. Right. Um, yeah, so that's quite the uh, career change. <laughs> Yes, and some of his videos are uh, subtitled uh, in English, uh, and he has, I, I had a look at the channel, he has quite a respectable viewership uh, figures there. Uh, to find his channel, our listeners can search for uh, Bukshital TV, with Bukshital written in Hangul, or they can look for his YouTube ID, which is a really long one. Uh, it's user-fv2hu4ex1g, but I'm going to ask the producer to put the link in the show notes so you don't have to go back and write that down. Uh, what... Has he managed to get any of his family out to uh, to South Korea? Uh, he didn't comment on that, yeah. And um, but yeah, definitely check out his YouTube channel. Mm. Uh, it's it's really interesting, and it's also just fun to watch. Okay, and what are his uh, his plans for the future? Uh, he's a very ambitious uh, young man. He he wants to be an actor, and mm. he's currently advising uh, actually uh, a South Korean uh, movie about mm. a North Korean soldier crossing the inter Korean border. So yeah. Uh, he's doing many things. Wow, okay. It's Good quite, with quite inspiring story, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you for sharing that, Yeji and Ifang. Uh, James, back to you. Um, 
Kim Jong Un revealed his daughter to the world that uh, he's uh, uh, he only had two public appearances uh, in November, and at both of them he brought his daughter out first to the uh, Hwasong 17 launch. Uh, but North Korea media revealed few details. So what have you been able to glean? Who exactly is she? And of course, the hot question, is she Kim Jong-un's designated successor? We really don't know uh, that much. Um, she was in a lot of pictures with Kim Jong-un and state media did refer to her as Kim's daughter. Um, but they didn't say, and this is the successor. Uh, they didn't even uh, say what her name is. Mm. Um, we assume that her name is Jue because of, um, and this is thanks to uh, former basketball player Dennis Rodman, mm. who visited North Korea several times at the beginning of Kim's rule, uh, became friends with the North Korean leader and said Kim Jong Un has a daughter called Jue. Um, so yeah, we we guess that's that's her name. It seems, according to, you know, r reports uh, that Kim Jong-un has uh, three children, uh, one born around 2010, another in 2013, which is uh, probably Jue, um, and another in 2017. And again, there are reports that uh, his eldest uh, might be a, a, a son as well. Hmm. Interesting that uh, he didn't bring out his eldest child then. Right, exactly. Yeah, it raises a lot of questions. You know, if we're going to think of uh, North Korea as a very conservative monarchy, then um, perhaps it would be the eldest son that inherits the, uh, the, the throne rights. But that's not obviously quite the case in North Korea. Kim Jong-un mm. himself yep. uh, has an older brother. Um, he had two once. Well, half-brother, yes, uh, who, yes, of course, was assassinated. And, uh, yeah, so that could, you know, uh, doesn't necessarily seem to be a factor um, in the question of whether she is Kim's successor. Uh, another thing that could count, could count against her is that she is uh, a girl uh, because most of North Korea's senior leadership are male. But then again, you know, uh, Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yo-jong, is, uh, well, a woman mm -hmm. uh, and has a very high-ranking position, gets a lot of media attention. So, you know, uh, maybe maybe things are, are changing in that respect. And maybe the most important thing is, is simply, you know, being a part of the Kim family, which, yep. which she is, the, the Pektu bloodline. Right. Um, and of course, you know, Kim Jong-un was kind of, uh, was seen by his, his father, Kim Jong-il, apparently. From an early age, he, he reportedly had the qualities needed to be a North Korean leader. You know, he was, he was very competitive, mm. very aggressive. And uh, this girl, you know, he, uh, Kim Jong-un might have seen something, something similar in his daughter. And so even though she is extremely young, uh, he might think that she has what it takes to become the next North Korean leader. But this is all, you know, it's all theories. We don't know much. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to have to wait and see. But why bring your daughter to a missile launch and not, say, uh, an on-the-spot guidance of a, uh, a turtle farm or a cornfield? Yeah, you're right. It is, a, it is an odd choice for a, a father-daughter day out. Mm. Um, State media reporting really emphasized that North Korea needs nuclear weapons, um, you know, needs this, this Hwasong-17 ICBM to protect our children from the US. So maybe Kim Jong-un bringing along his daughter, uh, being photographed alongside her, you know, and, the, and photographed next to this huge missile, um, maybe that was actually less about uh, announcing her as a su successor and more about emphasizing, uh, you know, that this is about the children and that even North mm. Korean leader Kim Jong-un is, is uh, you know, he's, he's really trying to emphasize that, that emotional uh, aspect to the, the North Korean people. I'm reminded of the, uh, the United States National Rifle Association's mantra that uh, the only thing that can stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, and perhaps uh, Kim Jong Un has taken that on board and believes that the only way to stop a bad country with nukes is for a good country to have nukes. I mean, that's what North Korea says, right? Yeah. It's developing nuclear weapons to for the stop, uh, yeah, for the children uh, to stop the U.S. from from invading. So, what does this all mean about uh, daughter and children and lineage? I mean, is this uh, idle speculation? Is it reading tea leaves? Is it the North Korean version of Kremlin Kremlinology? 
It is a little bit, yeah. Uh, we don't know. We don't know uh, if she's the successor, but um, we're going to keep talking about this because it's incredibly mm. uh, important who the who the next leader of North Korea is. Yeah, I think it's also interesting to, to note that uh, while the fact that she's a daughter has been revealed uh, by the North Korean media, the name has not. And I'm, I'm reminded of the time, again, back in, in August 2010, which was exactly six weeks before Kim Jong-un had his big coming out party, I couldn't get my North Korean guides to tell me the names of any of Kim Jong Il's children. That they uh, uh, they knew it, but they wouldn't share it. They would say, "Well, they said to me, if you know Jacko, why don't you tell us what their names are?" <laughs> and did you? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't shy about uh, telling what I knew. <laughs> All right. Thanks, James. Uh, Yeji and Ifung, let's talk about your uh, second story together about uh, BTS's Jin. What he can expect from his frontline military service at the North Korean border. Tell us a bit about that. Uh, yeah, so last month, I think, news came out that um, BTS' oldest member mm. is going to uh, at least a frontline training center. Ah. So, yeah, we thought it would be a good time to talk to some uh, soldiers who serve there uh, yep. at the border and see what they have to say. What, what can Gene, ex- Gene expect? Right. Uh, and and what... Uh what can he expect? Are fans worried about him being posted so close to the demilitarized zone? Yeah, so on Twitter, quite quickly after the news came out, we already saw some yeah, panicking fans saying, you know, uh, what, you know, please keep him safe and you know, because yeah, it is very close to North Korea and potentially dangerous. Yeah. Right. And of course the uh, their BTS fans are known as Army, and so here you've got Army worried about the Army. <laughs> That's right, yes. I'm surprised you didn't use that in your title. Uh, I'm also surprised to see Jin employ, or at least even doing any training uh, at a frontline unit, whether he'll be deployed there uh, permanently is another story. But I kind of expected that he would be put in one of those entertainment units that sing and perform for troops like other K-pop stars and actors have been in the past. Did that surprise you, Yeji? Um, well, I think you mean the ROK Army Band. Um, before the actual unit is signed to individuals, everyone goes through the same basic training period in camps based on their residence registration. Uh-huh. So because uh, Jin's residence is assumably based on in somewhere in Seoul, um, it's possible that he was assigned to the frontline training uh, camp. Uh, but afterwards, it's possible that he could be assigned to the army band. Ah. But in general, um, the majority of people who are sent for their initial training to uh, the frontline are also uh, serving at the front line later on. So the chances are there, yeah. Okay. And tell us what you learned by talking to other soldiers who have served in that area there. Is it dangerous? Um, yeah. So obvious dangers would be um, mines, armed counters, which rarely happen, but still. Um, isolation from central cities, um, tough winners. And a uh, former lieutenant and I talk to uh, told us that they're strictly instructed in that respect and there are accidents everywhere so there's no uh, need for uh, extreme panicking um, and another former guard patrol also warned on um, possible mental health issues um, mm. but others also um, contrastingly said that the experience was pretty refreshing. Refreshing? How so? Um, they were able to uh, take the moment of tranquility in mm. rural areas and also see um, the North Korean soldiers uh, across the border and kind of reflect on their own privileged wow. life in South Korea. Okay. And are conditions pretty strict near the demilitarized zone compared to uh, rear guard soldiers? Uh, so I've heard that things have gotten less ris- uh, less strict mm-hmm. um, with more phone use allowed. Um, right. But uh, there are usually less days off than non-frontline troops. Mm-hmm. Okay. And do you think that uh, Jin would expect to suffer the kind of hazing or bullying at the hands of other older soldiers, especially because of his stature as a global K-pop star? Uh, I don't know about that, but in general, bullying is quite a serious issue uh, in the yeah South Korean army, uh, as well as mental health issues. So mm-hmm. last year, out of 103 deaths in the South Korean armed forces, 83 were attributed to uh, suicide. So. Boy. And that's a downward trend, actually, uh, since 2012, yeah. because there were some military reforms allowing, you know, mobile phone use mm-hmm. and yeah, more I'm family told by visits. My, my wife's nephew, she said that yeah. mobile phone use has helped to really bring down the bullying. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Because so, you can film stuff and you can tell people stuff. Yeah, you can document right. the, the bullying. Yeah, so, but, but, but yeah, it's, it's an issue for sure, yeah. 
And if I'm not mistaken, I think it's uh, suicide and mental health are issues that BTS themselves have campaigned on, isn't it? Aren't they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so it'll be interesting to see how he goes here. Um, 18 months is the uh, the average term these days, isn't it? Um, I understand that there are some privileges that frontline soldiers can enjoy. Please tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, some of the uh, guys we talked to said, you know, we had a little bit better than our friends who were mm. stationed elsewhere because uh, they got treated sometimes with uh, ice cream, uh, watermelons. Wow. <laughs> and generally also, um, yeah, better equipment because they're closer to uh, right. the military threat. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, comparing that to the uh, story we talked about earlier about the frontline North Korean troops who were only getting a bit of rice and a bit of oil. That's, uh, that's quite a stark uh, yeah, contrast, that's, isn't it? that's a big difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. Okay, well, I, I hope he uh, makes it out of there and uh, uses his time wisely and makes something good out of it. Huh? All right, thanks very much. Uh, James, on to your third story. Talk about thing, let's talk about Summer Tree. Uh, Presidents Biden and Xi Jinping met for their first in-person summit in November. Uh, not their first one ever, but the first one since... Uh, Joe Biden became president. Uh, in this meeting, Biden expressed doubts about China's ability to control North Korea. Tell us more. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, Biden and she held this summit uh, during the G20 in Indonesia. There are a few details about exactly what they talked about uh, concerning North Korea from official statements. Uh, but judging by the amount of uh, text that uh, North Korea managed to get in those statements, uh, you might assume that it was a, a, an important but mm. relatively minor issue. Biden told reporters that uh, he warned Xi that the, uh, that the US would be more up in the face of China uh, if North Korea continues to increase tensions on the peninsula. Uh, but interestingly, because the US, you know, it's always calling on China to properly implement uh, UN sanctions mm. and and ramp up the pressure on North Korea because, you know, China is by far North Korea's largest trading partner, right? And uh, the US wants to, uh, you know, China to use that against North Korea and convince it uh, toward denuclearization. But Biden said that while he's confident that China isn't looking for North Korea to engage in further escalatory means, it's difficult to say uh, whether or not China can control North Korea. So even at the top level in the US, mm. uh, there's, there's doubt about uh, whether China's really able to do anything. Now, something that we've been talking about here on the podcast for the last couple of years is that uh, Chinese enforcement of UN sanctions has really dropped off. Uh, now, of course, China, as one of the, the permanent five members of the uh, Security Council, uh, is absolutely necessary to uh, put any new sanctions in place. And because of China's role in being the major trading partner of North Korea, it's also important uh, to enforce those sanctions. Do you think that uh, President Biden has any success in getting President Xi to agree to enforce the existing sanctions? I think he had very little success in that regard. Mm. And of course, North Korea, uh, soon after that Biden-Xi summit, that's when they fired the Hwasong-17. And uh, again, there was no uh, action from China at the UN regarding uh, Security Council sanctions. Uh, I think the, it's evident that North Korea can probably l- launch many, many missiles mm. and there are going to be no consequences from China at the UN. Um, but we're going to have to wait and see um, how China reacts to a nuclear test yes. if this ever happens uh, or when this happens. Of course, North Korea has been prepared for this apparently for, for a very, very long time. Um, but, you know, with, with rivalry intensifying between Washington and Beijing on a, on a number of issues, uh, China's probably less inclined than ever to uh, even, you know, in, endorse on paper another round of sanctions at the UN. Yes, the, uh, the possible response of China to any nuclear test is, of course, the, the big question, and whether, whether it's been fear of that response that has kept North Korea from, uh, from actually going ahead with the test despite saying that it was ready for it. That's true. Yeah, that's another, you know, possibility that maybe, you know, maybe behind the scenes that mm. is what's keeping North Korea from the nuclear test. But, um, you know, North Korea has conducted, uh, you know, its other six nuclear tests and, uh, you know, probably with, with full knowledge that China wasn't going to uh, appreciate it. And mm. that doesn't seem to deter North Korea at the end of the day. I think it at least 
you know, uh, maybe assumes or relies on the fact that while China might not like North Korea sparking uh, tensions with the US too much on the peninsula, it prefers North Korea existing as a as a buffer state uh, between it and US troops in the south. And so mm. therefore, it's not going to do anything that would uh, really undermine the uh, the Kim Jong-un regime in North Korea. Okay, well, we'll have to keep watching uh, China's role here. Uh, and then I understand that uh, President Biden also had a trilateral meeting with South Korea's President Yoon Suk yeol and Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. What was achieved here and what was the broader significance? So I think this is actually the more significant summit, in my opinion, because, of course, the, the U.S. is going to uh, focus on trying to achieve North Korean denuclearization through sanctions and trying to get China on side and also through diplomacy. Uh, it keeps saying, you know, we're open for talks, we're open for talks. Um, but, of course... Uh, that's not achieving anything at all at the moment. Um, but what the US is achieving is bringing its allies together, South Korea and Japan, on military issues. And that was something that was really difficult to do under the previous Moon Jae-in administration in, in the South because of historical issues. So that's been a really, really big change since uh, Yoon song yeol came to power. There were, you know, not lots of uh, in-depth detail about uh, perhaps the the specifics of what mm -hmm. was discussed at the summit but it did include uh, what their response to a nuclear test would be um i'd imagine that's going to be more sanctions which might not achieve that much to be honest and more military exercises which uh, at the very least will increase the allies uh, readiness and send a strong message of unity to North Korea that the US and its allies, South Korea and Japan, are on the same page. Yes, yeah, so trilateral exercises, right, involving all those three countries. That's, uh, that's really something we haven't seen much of in recent years, as you point out, during uh, President Moon's time and also the, uh, the late Prime Minister Abe. Uh, but now it's, uh, it's really ramping up. And is that something that they specifically said we will see more of if there were uh, a nuclear test from North Korea. I'm sure it's inevitable, you know, after after all the big uh, missile tests, there's, you know, there's been a lot of military exercises in the area involving the US. Right. And they, did they specifically say um, that uh, North Korea's denuclearization is, is what they're trying to achieve? Uh, I'd have to go back and check the statements, uh, exactly what it, what it said. But uh, they normally say that's right, uh, that we're calling for North Korea's denuclearization it's not a it's not a policy that's that's changed or probably it's not going to change anytime soon. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much James. Uh let to all of you open question uh, final thoughts, predictions, stories to come. What are you looking for uh in December? Of course we've got the uh the big holiday coming up, December 24th. That's Kim Jong Suk's birthday. It's the North Korean version of Christmas. Well, there's going to be a big party meeting at the end of December mm. and that's going to um, so Kim Jong-un used to deliver a New Year's speech right. and that was a big uh, report and he'd detail uh, what has been in the past year and also what direction the country is going to go in the coming year and that could you know sometimes include really big foreign policy announcements and that's kind of been replaced by these end of year um, meetings so mm. that's really going to be the, the big thing to look out for um, at the end of this year and at the beginning of next year as well. Yeah, expecting to see some photographs taken from that uh, wood panel study with the giant portraits and lots of officials taking notes and listening carefully. Yeah, and uh, we're going to have to look out for signs of the signs of the nuclear test as well, mm. and uh, yeah, more more missile development. And uh, of course, Kim made a you know he has his his uh, five year plan, and he's he's outlined a lot of. His, his missile checklist of the, the weapons that he wants to develop. And he's done some of those things, and there are still many more to come. Hey, it'll be interesting to see if he brings along some of the kids to the, uh, the end-of-year party meeting as well. Uh, Yeji, final thoughts from you. What are you looking at? For Korea Pro side, um, the striking chalker situation is pretty oh, yeah. big here. So um, with Yoon making more uh, moves to have more stronger response to that is something that should be we should be looking forward to right yep okay and ifang what's uh, what's on your mind um russia dprk relations mm. so 
I still haven't seen the evidence that Russia has shipped arms. Uh, oh, right sorry, the other way around. Yeah. North Korea has shipped arms to Russia. So yesterday, actually, huh? um, the U.S. Uh, chief of intelligence, Avril Haines, again repeated that you know North Korea has shipped mm. a, a small amount of arms uh, to Russia. Yeah, I, 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 I'm really curious um, whether we will see some North Korean mortars being used in Ukraine. You know. Because that's the only way that we can possibly verify it as journalists by seeing these uh, weapons or uh, yeah munitions deployed on right. the battlefield. But of course, I mean, if if those munitions only got sent across the border to the Russia's Far East, yeah, uh, and not to Ukraine, then it would make it would mean that uh, the existing munitions that Rus- the Russian army has can be moved from say east towards the west towards ukraine so it doesn't mean doesn't mean necessarily that north korean weapons will be going all the way to ukraine exactly that would be spectacular if it did yeah would be a big issue yeah so that's that's one one thing that experts are saying is that you know it could be that if these weapons or ammunition ammunition are being shipped yeah then it could be just to stock up right the russian supplies and uh, we will not see deployed as we for example did with iranian drones Mm. in in iran Yeah. yeah So I'll be on the lookout for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Yeji Chong, Yifang Bremer, and James Fretwell for joining me on the podcast. And uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to all of you. Thank you thank very much. You. you too, Jacko. Ladies and gentlemen, if you already have an NK News account and if you're a think tank, business, or an academic institution, take a look at NK Pro. Our NK Pro platform offers unparalleled services specifically catering to the needs of professionals who monitor developments on the Korean Peninsula. You can inquire about access by sending an email to membership at nknews.org today. Also, think about Korea Pro. Uh, Yeji's already mentioned a few stories today, which is focusing more on news out of South Korea, better than what the English language media can normally provide you. Our thanks, as always, go to Brian Betts and Darius Dare for facilitating this episode, and to our post-recording producer genius, Gabby Magnuson, who cuts out all the extraneous noises, awkward pauses, bodily functions, etc. Thank you very much for listening again next time. (laughs) 